The following is a response to Jeffrey, a member of the Patreon community that supports us and for whose support we are most grateful, all of us here at Democracy at Work. Jeffrey asks a simple, straightforward question. Those are usually the best kind. He asks whether there's ever been a comprehensive study of what mergers and acquisitions, as they are called in the capitalist world, what they have achieved. Have they been efficiency mechanisms? Have they improved or deteriorated the inequality of income and wealth in the society? What, in short, have been the costs and benefits of mergers in big business? And he asks, for example, uh, in the relationship for the, of the recent merger between Disney and Fox, or part of Fox. Well, there are two answers, as always, to these kinds of important questions. On the one hand, yes, there have been a variety of studies, most of them about particular mergers and acquisitions, where the researcher and the analyst goes in and tries to understand what caused these two companies uh, to become one, why did it happen, how did it happen, and then some of them look into what the longer-term consequences are, but there aren't many, and there are even fewer that make the effort to make it comprehensive. And I'd like to address why the literature is small, not very good, and ends up with a kind of ambivalent relationship. Because that's really the crucial point here. Mergers and acquisitions are undertaken for a variety of reasons. But one of the most basic, not always the only one, and not even necessarily the main one, but one of the big ones playing a role is the effort to make more money. One or the other merger partner sees an advantage. Most of the time, the advantage is kind of straightforward. If you merge two companies, you save money that can be turned into profit. The simplest example, if you have two corporations, each of them will likely be maintaining a big, top-heavy front office, the place where the executives gather, the place where the high-powered lunches are paid for, etc. Two corporations spend a lot of money doing that for two sets of executives. If you merge the two corporations, well then, you only have to do it for one set of executives. Most mergers and acquisitions do not double the number of CEOs or double the number of members of boards of directors and so on. So there are savings, and those occur up and down the line. You can save on your fleet of trucks. You don't need twice as many trucks. You can get more out of one set of trucks, and you can sell off at least part of the other set of trucks. And the same is true of your computers, and the same is true of your office or back offices, of your factory space, of your machinery replacement, and you go on and on. In other words, profit can be improved by the savings accomplished when the two companies get together. Now, here's an important point. The justification for mergers and acquisitions is always oh, we will save on costs, um, but we'll pass those savings on to the consumer. Well, most of the time, that does not happen. Those savings were attractive precisely because they would go into profits. So what the one company that emerges out of two wants is to save, that's sure true enough, to lay off large numbers of workers, to sell off equipment that is duplicating other equipment that they don't need double of anymore. But they're not doing that in order to do a lovely service for the consumer. Of course not. They're doing that to boost profits. Now they may, for public relations purposes, cut the price of output, perhaps to compete with another company. But that's a byproduct. That's a maybe. That's a, if we have to, 
but it is not an intrinsic part of mergers and acquisitions. They're about profits. They're made by the people whose job it is to maximize the profit of the company. It's not their job to take care of the mass of employees, and it's not their job to satisfy consumers. The bottom line is the profit, and that's what's going on. You also have mergers and acquisitions, which are undertaken for a different reason, even if the prospects of more profit are dim. One company may be in trouble, and it merges with another one so it can more easily shift its business out of what isn't working real well into another line of work. You'll sometimes see that happen when a company doing one kind of thing buys another one in a completely different industry. That may be a sign of an avoidance of collapse by the company in the shrinking industry by moving it to another. Sometimes it's a pure vanity play. That's what they call it. One of the executives in one company want to become bigger shots in their community, which might be the whole country, and so they buy up other buildings to become a conglomerate because it makes them a bigger and bigger fish. Sometimes the merger and acquisition really has nothing to do with the companies being bought and sold. It's a financial maneuver. It allows shares to be created and sold to a public eager to buy into what looks like a growing company. A lot of finagling goes on on the financial level to go along with this. But there are some basic conclusions you can draw. Mergers and acquisitions are moves made by big companies to become bigger. They are part of the monopolization process in capitalism, whereby many companies become few. And of course, the few that remain as this process goes on, are more and more wealthy and therefore wield more and more market power. And as a result, you have a growing concentration of power in ever fewer corporate hands. We've been seeing that for decades in the United States. This intrinsic tendency of capitalism to produce ever more enormous corporations, fewer of them but more enormous, is why in every capitalist country the government has sooner or later been called in to set up an antitrust department to begin to put pressure on companies not to get bigger, to become smaller by breaking into smaller ones. Why? Because the average public and most businesses have been hurt by the power concentrated in the huge companies and so have pushed back. Capitalism produces the antitrust movement because of its tendency through mergers and acquisitions to become a highly concentrated sort of production system. So capitalism produces concentration, merger and acquisition is the result, and the effects on the society have always been extremely contradictory. Yes, sometimes more efficiency, but also more concentrated power, and therefore more likelihood that the concentrated power will serve the people who make the mergers and acquisitions occur. They become richer relative to everybody else. The division of society into haves and have-nots worsens. It's the history of capitalism, and that's where mergers and acquisitions fit. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your question, and I hope this has been an interesting answer.